We're in the book of Luke, chapter 1. We're actually going to start off a little bit earlier before Mary's song. Today, the title of the sermon is Mary's Song. And uh, we find it in the book of Luke, chapter 1. And Luke is a doctor. All right, so he's kind of late coming to Christianity. Um, he comes in in the book of Acts, and we see him interact with the, uh, the disciples and the apostles and Paul. And so here's a doctor, you know, equipped to do things medically, comes in and he starts seeing miracles, right? Where people are getting healed and it's shocking him and he becomes a Christian. And so while he's a Christian, he's asked by a very prominent Lord in the area to, he gets essentially paid to investigate the claims of Christianity. So he goes around asking the disciples different questions. Hey, so tell me about the story of, you know, the feeding of the 5,000. Was it just, you know, a bunch of people bringing a food together or was it like actually Jesus multiplying food out of thin air? Did he actually walk across water? Peter, did you fall into the water? Like, tell me this story. And so, I mean, he's probably heard these stories around a campfire from time to time, but now he's actually going down with pen and paper and writing them down. He, and he says at the beginning of Luke chapter 1, you know, lots of other people have already written down accounts of the Gospels and the stories of Jesus, but I'm trying to come up with a, an orderly account. I'm trying to come up and ask all these different people, and I want to talk to eyewitnesses, people who are actually there. So he talks to people and what they saw on the cross, he talks to people about the resurrection of Jesus and all these different stories. And then he talks to the mother of Jesus to find out those early days before everyone knew anything was happening. Tell me your story, Mary. And this is what we find. So we have Luke the doctor who's talking to eyewitnesses. He's investigating all these different stories, and he wants to find out what really happened in those early days. You know, he heard the stories of angelic beings coming down and talking. He wants to hear from the mouth of Mary what really happened. And so let's start in verse 26 as Mary tells her story of Jesus. So Luke chapter 1 and verse 26 says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. All right, so this is Luke's investigative report. He's given all the background details, a lot of maybe some unnecessary things, right? But he's just, he's putting all the details down. So verse 28, and he came to her, an angel came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Wow, so here's the story, and, and Mary's, I don't know what she's doing that day, but up comes an angel. And this is a unique scenario, right? And Mary's afraid automatically when he greets her, right? Like, it's a scary thing for an angel to come down and talk to anyone. These are not regular beings. These are not humans like you and I. They are different. You see all throughout the Old Testament, when people find and see angels, they typically freak out. We have maybe like this, uh, you know, the angelic view of angels that we think of nowadays is like the nice painted pictures we see in cathedrals and basically people with wings or something like that. Maybe they glow a little. But the pictures of angels in the Bible are shocking. Um, some of the ways that you see the pictures of angels, they're, it, they're ridiculous. And when people see them... People freak out, fall down on the ground. Sometimes they start to worship angels, and angels are like, no, don't do that. We even see sometimes, like in the book of Daniel, where a guy saw an angel, and he literally peed his pants because he was so afraid. 
angels are magnificent beings that are servants of God. And so here's an angel that comes to Mary and she reacts wrongly. Like she was a little troubled right at the beginning. She was, she was frightened and rightly so. But the angel said, Mary, don't be afraid, right? And, and I can only think if I was in that scenario, like how would I react to meeting an angel? I would probably react wrongly. I would probably like, I don't know. It, there's so many times I react wrongly anyways. But to meet an angel, I wouldn't know what to do. So he said, you know, don't be afraid, Mary. And he said, you found favor with God. God is gracious. And so uh, he is choosing you to do something miraculous, to conceive and bear a child. And I can only imagine what she's thinking. Nobody's going to believe me. You're going to give me this miraculous gift of a baby, and everyone's going to think the worst of me. Even my own, you know, she's, you know, a spouse to her husband, so she's basically engaged. It's a little bit different in the Jewish culture. Um, and, and he starts to describe, he says, you know, his name is going to be Jesus. And so the funny thing about that is, you know, at least Mary and Joseph didn't have to struggle about the name. I don't know about you guys, but when it comes to Melissa and I picking names, it's like, all right, here's 30 names I like. Let's whittle that down to four, and now you've got four names that you like. Now let's have you know a real serious talk about which of these eight names are going to make it into the final four or the final two, and then we finally come up with the number one. And sometimes we don't even pick the middle name until the kid's born, so we, you know, it helps decide, you know, is this kid that name or that name? They didn't have to choose the name. God says, I got this. We've already got the name picked out. And so uh, he told Mary, hey, call him Jesus. And then he described Jesus five different ways. Number one, Jesus will be great. So if you think of all the different people that had the anachrom, like the great after their name, who do you think of? I like to think of Frederick the Great. I'm a little biased in that area. Great guy. Um little old school, but uh, there's lots of different people. And you think of like Ivan the Terrible, you think of Napoleon, one of the greatest conquerors uh, of the ancient times, you think of um, Caesar, you think of um, Alexander the Great, all these different people were great, and many were great because they did things, like they changed the world economically or changed the world militarily. Um, they came up with great ideas, great inventions. There's so many different people that are great in this world, and yet even people who are not Christians understand that when we talk about the greatest of people who have ever lived, that Jesus is at the top. Because he changed this world more than anyone else who's ever lived. And then the angel, who's talking to Mary, says that he is called the Son of the Most High. So he's just not going to be some great prophet, some great king, some great dude. He's going to be the Son of the Most High. And the Most High is used all throughout Scripture of the one who created the entire universe, the one who is above all, who is above all angels, above all demons, above everything that's ever been, that's ever, that we can even see. And so Jesus is not a mere mortal. We see here that there's a glimpse of his divinity given in this picture. And then he says, we'll, he will be given the throne of his father, David. Now, this is crazy. So here's Mary listening to this angel. And the angel says, hey, your son, Jesus, is not only going to be great, he's not only son of the most high, but he's actually going to be the king. He's going to take the throne of, the, of your father, David. And so he's hearkening back to a promise that he gave to King David that of his line, a king would be king forever. And so, you know, throughout the promises, many people didn't know if that promise was ever true because actually the line was broken. The line of kings was broken long, long ago when the country was divided and conquered and conquered and conquered. And there was a lot of doubt with that. And here we have the angel saying that here's this guy going to take over the throne. And immediately, how scary could that be? You know, right now, Mary is, you know, in... You know, her hometown that's conquered with foreign kings over her. And if people were to know that the son of the Most High, who's going to take over the throne of the father David, they'd probably want to kill her, right? She, she probably understood her, understood the angel that 
there's going to be issues with this, that the government's going to have a problem with her son. And then he said he's going to reign over the house of Jacob forever. Again, hearkening back to an even more ancient prophecy where God told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he is going to promise them not only a seed that will um, spread throughout the the world but and bless all nations, but that... Um, that through their seed that God will bless all nations. And it's like here is these ancient prophecies that the that the angel is talking to her about and it's probably overwhelming her. All these different things like what? I'm having a child by God and it's he's gonna be the greatest thing ever apparently. And the last one it says his kingdom will never end. And that's a crazy thing to say, right? Because every kingdom that's ever been up until that point and even after that point has always ended. You think of the Babylonian Empire, they ended. You think of even, I mean, like I said before, King David and Solomon's empire. Solomon was one of the richest men who ever lived, and his empire ended one generation after him. You think of all the great empires of the past, the Roman Empire, which is one of the greatest empires in the world, that failed. The Mongolian Empire, that failed. All the great Chinese empires failed. The Indian empires have failed. Even the Native American empires failed. Every humankind, every, every man kingdom that there's ever been has always failed. But this is going to be different. This is a kingdom, and again, the scripture talks about how this kingdom is a little bit different, but they didn't know that, right? When Mary heard this, she probably thought, oh, he's starting Israel eternal. He's, he's going to be king of Israel forever, and Israel's probably going to be the world power from here on out. They didn't know that the kingdom that God was talking about would be a little bit different looking. And so... How is this going to happen? I love Mary, how she's just very real about this whole thing. So verse 34, after she, you know, hears these five amazing things about her son, she says, all right, so uh, how is this, how will this be? Since I'm a virgin, how is this, how is this going to go down? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy. Jesus was holy. So, again, I always like to describe the word holy means different. So, even in his birth, it was different. He was not born of mankind. Sin did not pass down from his father to him. Joseph was not his true earthly father, so he didn't inherit that sinfulness that all of us inherit when we are born. When Jesus was born, he was born of the Holy Spirit and the Most High, of God. The Trinity was working together to make this miracle happen. And so, I love it. As, as they're talking about this, I mean, understandably, Mary's confused. She's like, God, like, angel, this doesn't make sense. How is this going to happen? And, and he, he starts to describe to her. And then I think one of the most clear things he does is actually describe that, hey, I understand this is a miracle. You probably don't understand, but let me give you an example of how God can do some miracles. Um, so the next few verses, what does he say? Verse 36, and behold, look, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who, has call, who was called barren for nothing will be impossible with God. I love it because, so her cousin, Elizabeth, who was going to have John the Baptist, who was going to pave the way for him, kind of like a trumpeter paves the way for a great king, says, all right, so your cousin, two issues, your cousin's actually super old, past the time of actually having a kid, and also she's barren. She couldn't have a kid. They tried to have a kid, and for her whole life she could never have a kid. God said, I'm going to, you know, allow her to have a child. And so he miraculously changed her body on a molecular level far beyond even what science many times can do today and did this 2,000 years ago. And she, as an elderly barren woman, had a child. And it shows that God can do the impossible. I love that phrase in verse 37, for nothing will be impossible with God. That's something that is a principle at large 
that God can do to us what seems impossible. God can do the miraculous. And here is, I, you can only picture Luke, you know, uh, the the medical doctor thinking all this through. Like, all right, so this, so your cousin, maybe he checked his sources. Maybe he, you know, checked with Elizabeth, or at that time Elizabeth may have passed on, and so he may have checked with people that knew her. And yeah, she was barren; she couldn't have a kid, and he found out that this is true. And, like, he's understanding that, like, having a child super late in life is not just rare, it's impossible. And so this is something that, as he's writing down this story, as he's, you know, hearing from the words of the eyewitnesses what really went down, he's in awe as he's writing down this story. And Mary said, verse 38, Behold, look. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So she may not have understood it all, but she said, you know what? Even if I don't understand it, look, I am God's servant. And I love her heart. I love her attitude. I am God's servant. Let it be to me. Let God do what he wants to me. And that's such a great heart attitude to have. Understanding that God can do miraculous things, right? Her response is that she is the servant of the Lord. And guys, that is our response as Christians today. To anything that God is doing, whether miraculous or seemingly not miraculous in our life, our response to God should be the same response as Mary's was. God, I am your servant. You could pray this prayer every day. God, I am your servant. Let it be done to me according to your word. Whatever is going to happen in my life, if it's good that's coming my way or if it's bad that's coming my way, God, I am your servant and I will obey you and trust you and follow you no matter what. It, it reminds me, honestly, of uh, one of my favorite stories in the scripture of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego while they're being you know, almost thrown into the, the fiery pit from the king. And they, they basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, that, you know, that they're just going to obey God, and, and it's up to God what happens, that they just were his servants. And, and this same idea is throughout all of time, our response as followers of God of what we're going to do in response to anything that comes with us in life. Obviously, in Mary's case, it was pretty unique. So here comes Luke. You know, he's writing. He's investigating eyewitnesses. So he keeps on. And, you know, what does he say? Verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. So she went and hung out with Elizabeth. Honestly, this is what lots of people do. When you get new news, if you get especially exciting news, like you're going to have a baby, what's the first thing you do? Get on your cell phone and call and tell somebody, right? They didn't have cell phones back then. So she went with haste. So she went pretty quickly and went over to her cousin, and they talked about it. And um, so verse 41, it says, And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, the mother of my Lord, should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. So they obviously had a discussion about this. Elizabeth was excited that her baby leapt in her stomach or tummy for when they met each other. That's that's a pretty fun thing, right? And they were just overjoyed. It's kind of like cousins coming together. It's one of the favorite times of Christmas, right, is when you get to see your family members, your friends, and you come together and you give big hugs and you say hello to people you haven't seen in quite a while. And it's a great reunion. And this is kind of what was happening with Mary. She went to see her cousins, her cousin, and she was super happy to see each other other and her cousin just start started exclaiming really loudly like wow like all these statements about blessings and the very last one i really like verse 45 it says and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the lord and that's an interesting one because, you know, I automatically think that, oh, Mary, Mary, obviously, I mean, if she saw a mir- miraculous angel, of course she would believe that she would have a baby. 
But that's a unique thing to believe, that someone is going to come to you and say, while you're a virgin, you're actually still going to have a child, and you're going to call him Jesus, and he's actually from God. And understandably, no one else is probably going to believe you, which is why the angel actually had to go back and talk to her soon-to-be husband, Joseph. And so here is Mary, and she believed God. And we see throughout the scriptures that God has done similar things like this before in ancient times. If you think of the prophet Samuel, his mother, Hannah, wasn't able to have a child. And she prayed to God, and God allowed that miraculous birth to happen. We see even with Abraham wasn't able to have a child, and yet God allowed his wife, Sarah, to have a child in her old age. God has this ability to do things through time and space that are impossible to men. And Mary, when she heard of it from an angel, she believed that it would happen. Belief is a weird thing, right? It's, I mean, there's always something that we believe in. We always believe on a, you know, logistical everyday that our chairs aren't going to fall from underneath us. Sometimes they do uh, when they're not built well. Um, We all have a belief in something. And our belief many times gets tested um, from people around us, circumstances, bad things that happen, even good things that happen in our life can test our faith. Um, But here is Mary throughout everything that's happening to her life, even whether or not her soon-to-be husband didn't understand her, didn't believe her, um, all these different people, her family probably didn't believe her for a very long time. Probably many people didn't believe her until 30 years later when Jesus actually started doing miracles. And so here is Mary believing that God would fulfill everything that he told her. And, and like it, all these, all these, w- this weight of emotion was probably crushing her of people not believing. She probably had family members yelling at her. A lot of different things was going on. She probably thought her engagement might be called off by Joseph and whatever was going on in her heart. She came at this point and she wrote a song. Verse 46 and on to 56. She wrote a song. You see, Mary was one of those creative types. I don't, not everyone is like this, right? Not all of us have ever written a song or even attempted to write a song. But she wrote a song because of what was happening, because of her belief. Um, It was interesting, just yesterday, before I jump in to her song, um, in regards to belief, um, I've been teaching all four of my kids to ice skate in the last 11 years that they've been alive, right? And I keep telling them, you know, you have to trust the the skates and you have to, you know, push off properly and you have to learn to balance yourself. Um, But essentially, I'm teaching them to have faith that the ice skates will work and that if you do it properly, you can skate and have fun and go really fast and not slip and fall on your, your butt, your hands and knees and hurt yourself and cry. But all four of my kids go through different stages where, like, Zara now, she's the oldest. She can go really fast. She's all on her own. There's Dane, who sometimes still stumbles but still goes around pretty well. And Kay just really learned this last week how to do it on his own. And he's started to go crazy, but also he hurt himself a few times pretty bad yesterday. And then there's Isla, who I basically have to try to carry the entire time. And she doesn't trust the skates at all. She can stand for a few seconds. And I say that all to say is I'm trying to teach my kids to have faith in the skates and and show them how to skate for them not to fail. And some of them cry, some of them get angry, and they have all these different reactions to the experience of attempting to skate, right? And here we have Mary, who's heard that God can do miraculous things, who knows that this angel was miraculous and something amazing is happening to her. And just like when I talk to my kids and I, I talk to my um, my little ones and trying to show them how to skate and pick them up and, and show them that they can keep on moving forward, 
God was helping Mary throughout this time, and his spirit was with her and helping her so that, you know, she didn't know how to live. Like, what what are you going to do in your life? When God promises you're going to have a kid, are you going to get kicked out of your, your parents' home because they think you're sleeping around? Do, are you going to get kicked out are you of your relationship with Joseph because he doesn't think that you're going to have a child with God? Like, all these things, like so many emotions, and then, and then God sent another, you know, angel to talk with Joseph. Joseph, and now she's talking to her cousin, and her cousin believes her, and she's just being overwhelmed by everything she's facing in her life. And she writes this story, and I love it. She starts off with the story, My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. That word magnify also means celebrate. She's celebrating God in her song. And that's honestly, like with my illustration of skating, is uh, like in faith in general, when you approach God, you either celebrate him or you, you don't care. You don't want to have anything to do with it and you forget it and you look away or you get mad at God. And it's the same way with my kids. They either celebrate when they're skating or they're mad because they're falling and they're hurting themselves and they let the problems of life stop them from having fun on the skates. It's the same way, like, with anything that's God, that God has gifted us in this life, with our faith that we have in this life, we can fail like many people do on skates, or we can struggle through that turmoil that all of us have in our life and all the issues, whether internal or external, and celebrate God throughout all of it, just like Mary did. She wrote a song, My Soul. I love that word, soul. Soul is an old school word. We don't always use it. Soul is kind of like your inner self. And your inner your inner being that it's kind of like a piano where your inner being plays the piano of all the different attributes of your life. And it, it, it can, you know, choose to be happy or sad. It can choose to uh, work really hard that day or be really lazy on another day and take a Sabbath. Her soul, her inner being, her real self magnifies the Lord. She wants to celebrate in God for everything that he's done to her. Why? For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, for look, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. She realized that this was something miraculous happening that all generations like that's incredible to think and and honestly it's true whether or not we say bc before christ or or ad anno domini in the year of our lord or we say bce common era and all these different things whatever take you take on it the entire world actually orders all of the years around his birth all generations will call me blessed God looked on her. She wasn't a perfect person. Um, that is a theology that out there, that's out there, that she was perfect. No, Scripture says all have fallen and, you know, fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. All deserve death and hell. And so she, as a servant of God, wasn't perfect, but she humbled herself. That's such an amazing attribute that God chose this young virgin in a country bumpkin town that nobody really cared about and chose Mary to send his son. He chose a humble servant. I love it because God likes to flip the script on those who are powerful, strong, rich in this world, right? Like he didn't choose the richest queen of this world to have his child born of. He could have chose those type of queens around the world to have his child born of, but he didn't. He chose the lowliest. Why do you think God does that? Why do you think God likes to flip the script and choose the people that aren't that important in this world? I think it's the same reason why when he came himself, he worked a lowly job and he came not with the best looks. It's because he wants to show us that the things that we treasure as human beings many times are wrong that they're not what actually brings true joy and true blessedness in life. Verse 49 says, For he who is mighty 
has done great things for me, and holy is his name. She was being thankful. I love not only, you know, she's self-reflective in her song, talking about how she is lowly and humble, but she's also thankful for God. And that's something that's always amazing in songs, right? If you're writing a song like putting thankful things down, it's amazing to always reflect every day to start off your day with reflection. is such an amazing thing to go through. And I think that's what God wants us to be a part of. That's why we sing songs on Sundays, to help us to be thankful for what God has given us. God's given us minds to think. He's given us this air to breathe. He's given us so many different things in this life. A job, a house, a vehicle. God has gifted us with so much. A world to experience. Be thankful. She then goes on. says, His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. She talks about fearing God. Fearing God is something, again, that's not talked about that much. God is the most frightening being in the world. That's many times when you see him in the Old Testament and, you know, we have these clownish images of God, you know, tucking himself or riding on a cloud. God's not like that. You realize, like, God hid himself in a cloud so we wouldn't all die when people saw God in the Old Testament. Um, Because if you saw him face to face, you'd literally die. And so, Understanding who God truly is, that he doesn't need air to breathe, that he lived and existed before the universe, that he created the entire universe and this entire world. And each generation has a different issue with him and has a different strength where Christianity and God's followers throughout all generations have each struggled to have a relationship with him and understand and just realize that it's really up to him, that it's all God's mercy that we can actually have a relationship with him in the first place. It's nothing we can do in and of ourselves. That idea that we see through Jesus on the cross perfectly, that it's all God, that our only hope to ever have a relationship is not by living perfectly, is not by trying to be goody two shoe or being on our best behavior because he's checking a list but because of his mercy. And you only truly understand his mercy when you first understand that you have to fear him. And that's the route that you have to take. And then she talks about his strength. I love it. Verse 51, he says, she says, he has shown me strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. I'm going to read really quick. Um, That word arm, I don't know if you guys know Isaiah 53. Isaiah was a prophet 600 years before who who wrote about the arm of the Lord. Isaiah 53 says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who is this arm? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of a dry ground. For he has no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. So Jesus, the arm of God, is not beautiful. That's an interesting one. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one who men hid their faces... He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him the chastisement that has brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Who does that sound like? It sounds like Jesus, 600 years before Jesus. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that was before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And he made his grave with the wicked 
and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. I love that. Make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore... I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Jesus is the arm of the Lord. And here Mary in her in her song writes about and as Luke is writing down her song as he's hearing her story she talks about the arm of the Lord. Verse 30 verse 52 she continues she says he has brought down the mighty from their thrones the exalted ones those humble and exalted those of humble estate. Again he flips it where those who think they are mighty are brought down to nothing. And those who are lowly are exalted by God. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. You think of the story of the birth of Jesus. You know, the King Herod tried to kill him. Proud, powerful man with an army. What happened to him? Years later, he died. He was brought down to nothing. No one remembers him anymore, except in the story of the rise of Jesus, who was truly the humble one, whom God exalted above all. And he used his servant Mary to do this all. She knew that God would help Israel, that God would fulfill his promise to Abraham and his offspring, which he did. And so as you think of this story, the story of Luke having a conversation with Mary about what happened in those early days of the birth of Jesus, I want us to think of just a couple different things as we close here. If you have creative gifts, use them to glorify God this Christmas season. God has created us just like he created Mary to be a servant of God, and he's gifted us all differently to creatively use all of our gifts for God, not just one or two people in the church, but everyone, to use all of our gifts to glorify God. There's so many different ways that this can happen. And also, as you're, as we go our way this week, just remember, remember to be humble. Humble is a big thing in this passage. Jesus was humble. He humbled himself, uh, you know, not thinking of, you know, being equal with God as something to be grasped, but gave it up to be a human. Mary was humble and God used her. God rejects the proud and gives grace to the humble. God loves to use those who are humble. And that's many times the first step in following God. Is humbling yourself. Why? Because you know that you are sinful. You know that you are fallen. You know that you need to fear him because he is God and you are not. Be humble. Give of your wealth to others. A couple, you know, these last few verses, she says, the rich he sends away empty. God doesn't want us to just hoard up money for ourselves but to use it wisely, to be good stewards of it, and to bless others as he has blessed us. And lastly, remember God's goodness and grace to you this season. It's so important that no matter what happens, no matter who we talk to, no matter what goes on at our work, at our home, with our kids, our spouse, our friends, our family, remember God's goodness and grace. And give God's grace to those around you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the story of Mary, that you use this lady in a great and mighty way because she was humble. 
Help us all be like her and be like you in this time. In the name of Jesus, amen.